In gambling, there's a common saying, the house always wins. After all, the majority of people who spend their nights and weekends throwing dice across the craps table or contemplating their next blackjack hand are typically relying on luck. Yu Chen Li, CEO and co-founder of Allegro, is not one of those people. I don't believe in lotteries. I'm a betting man. I bet on things with high probability. And the paradigm I found that suits my philosophy is one where you build a company the right way, one brick at a time, making sure the business is delivering value. Yu Chun is one of the founding members of the infamous MIT Blackjack cord counting team that was portrayed in the movie 21. With his earnings, he was able to bootstrap a software company named Unica into a $400 million acquisition by IBM. Now Yu Chun is back. He's building the next great software company with Allegro, an accelerated learning video-based sales platform. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Yu Chun explains how his calculated decision-making removes risk and details how it is using AI and machine learning to empower every sales professional to close the next deal. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Innovate fast, empower every employee, and scale with confidence from anywhere with a customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have Yu Chun Li, the CEO of Allego. Yu Chun, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. All right, let's get it started. What is Allego? Am I pronouncing that right, first of all? Allego? Allego, the name of the company is, is a root word for allegory. It's a, you know, telling a short story with a point. Uh, since our, our product is all about helping people communicate better, we, we figured that's a great name. Also, it starts with the letter A, which is great. <laughs> now, you are a veteran in let's call it communication platform. So you started, you know, your first business was Unica, which was a marketing automation provider. And I met you when you were heading up Clara Bridge, which was like, like I said, it's not quite exactly communications, but still in the same field you guys are doing analytics of what was being said among customers. What makes a Lego unique? The way you think about a Lego is we help companies onboard sales reps, uh, launch products, and in general, help each rep to be as productive as possible using mobile videos and collaboration and virtual selling nowadays, which is such an important component. The arc you're talking about, uh, Unica was about marketing. Clarebridge is about services. Allegro is about sales. So it's all about the front office, sales, marketing, and service, customer-facing function, if you will. That's, that's really my uh, sweet spot. There you go. And so you obviously, when you built, you were building companies long before Lego and those companies all had successful events or are still growing. So you had to know quite a bit about sales because famously at uh, Unica is you guys grew like the organic yeah. way, right? You guys grew, you, you weren't trying to do a massive VC event. You guys grew year over year over year. You ran Unica for how long before the acquisition IBM? 17, 18 years. You know, like a lot of tech founders would look at a 17 year path as, oh, that's too long. But you've been patiently in the game, and along the way, you've certainly seen how sales has evolved. Tell me what's different about the sales environment for software today that you know has changed fundamentally, and what made this opportunity for Lego uh, come about. The way I approach business is I don't believe in lotteries. Uh, as you know, I've, I'm a, I'm a betting, betting man. I, I bet on yep. things with high probability, and uh, the paradigm I found that suits my philosophy is one where you build a company uh, the right way, uh, one brick at a time, making sure the business is delivering value, the company know how to sell, the customers are successful, and then you rent and repeat that year in and year out. And that's sort of how we build Unica. And then frankly, it's the way we're doing that again here in Lego. We're also uh, organically grown. We're one of the fastest growing company in America, but we grew, we, we're growing the business organically and always maintain a cash flow neutral to positive posture as we grow. The way we look at the world of selling, a few other question is that, especially after pan the pandemic, organization need to figure out how to sell virtually because the face-to-face -face in person meetings are becoming rare. E even if after all of us have vaccines, a lot of buyers, they don't wanna meet the sellers because they're working remotely potentially. So companies are just beginning to figure out 
how do we engage our marketplace and our buyers remotely? And Allegro has all the capability to help organizations to do that. When I think about how we used to do enterprise deals at some of the software companies I've worked at, it was usually kind of like what you said, a meeting face to face, maybe some dinner, uh, maybe a lot of demos for sure. A lot, a lot of demos, a lot of stakeholder buy in. Ultimately, you hopefully close the deal. Yeah. What does a Lego change about that process? Because you're right. That's how it used to be. Like you could not close an enterprise deal without meeting. I don't know. It seemed like a hundred people, but it was probably less than that, but you get, you get the idea. Yeah. Tell me how you're changing it. Well, you know, to some extent, the pandemic sort of forced upon all of us to be able to operate remotely. Uh, if you asked me a year ago, could the whole, the whole software industry be able to sell everything that we do today remotely? I would say, you know, probably not likely it will take five years, but I think that the pandemic has truly accelerated the need to sell remotely. And the way you want to think about it is there are some sets of skills that a seller need to be better at in selling remotely and be able to read the room while you're on a Zoom call, like what we're doing, and be able to articulate value, even though you can't build that uh, report and trust ahead of time. And, and in general, how do you build a report and trust being remote? These are all new skill sets that we, leveraging technologies, leveraging videos of people's faces, leveraging virtual collaboration to form a new set of activities that actually, at the end of the day, is more productive. I mean, our sellers that are on a Lego today can engage their client probably five to 10 times more than they could have in person, just because it takes so little time to switch to another meeting virtually versus getting on a plane, fly to another city. So tell me what is fundamentally different in the technology, because of course you and I are meeting over Zoom, whether we use Zoom or any other type of web-based sharing tool, you know, I think someone who does not familiar with their tool is probably thinking, oh, okay, well, I get, you know, my prospect on the phone, I share my screen, I show them the software, uh, and then I have to go into my CRM and do something. Yep. That's probably what they're thinking. So tell me how a Lego does something a little differently. So there are many elements of a Lego platform, but if I could give you a few rundown, a, a set of capability that, that would help an organization that may be helpful to, to illuminate the, the area. One is on learning. So typically, when in a, in a sales organization, you go through training all the time, right? And, and organizations typically do that by flying you into some conference room somewhere. You know, you, they, they lock you in a room, put a pipe down your throat and shove like a thousand PowerPoint <laughs> through you and somehow <laughs> expect you to remember everything, right? So we know that that doesn't work. So we have a part of our product help organizations do what we call modern learning, which is, you know, bite size, do that over time. We gamify it, we make it fun. And um, over time, we, we focus on the retention, not just shoveling down those content down your throat. So that's on learning. On content, we're able to use technology to create content that are interactive, that are bite-sized, uh, using video or, or documents that, that are easily consumable. And we, we allow organizations to track and optimize which documents are most useful for sellers and what are, frankly, off-the-target documents. A lot of organizations create tons of content and most of them are, are never used or not really adding value. So we help an organization using technology, using AI to quickly figure out for each seller in a particular situation, what types of content are most useful. When I say content, it could be just-in-time learning content. It could be content about a competitor from yesterday, or it could be a collateral I should be using for a particular buyer, okay? And then on virtual selling, it's all about being able to engage and communicate and collaborate virtually we have capability that, that help you, in essence, simulate some of the interaction you would have in person, but do it online using a virtual room that you can interact with, et cetera. So I wanna hit on that idea, this, this ability to bring you and retain bite-sized pieces of information that are relevant. Because I think back to when I work with different, because obviously IT visionaries, we work with mostly tech companies, a lot of CIOs, CTOs, and they always talk about how you know, when their product is sold, so like, let's say I'm a leader of a tech company, but my product sold, typically I need a solutions engineer on these calls because the solutions engineer has, let's say deep domain experience in the product or the industry. And that person naturally is able to recall information, you know, pretty fast. So when, you know, a prospect asks them a question, this person can answer. And the conversation often goes to like, well, the sales rep, what's their role anymore? Like, because if that person's not providing this information, you know, the solutions team feels like, well, we're the ones selling the product. We're the ones answering all these questions. 
Is that what Allegro is trying to bridge? They provide this domain experience to the sales team? Is that kind of the concept of what you guys are doing? Yeah, I, I think if you stand back, selling still require a set of disciplines around how do you build trust and rapport? How do a seller truly understand what the buyer is trying to accomplish? How do you solve their problem and map a solution that matters to them, right? Sometimes a seller thinks they're going through a sales process. Frankly, they're just an observer in a buying process. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so the seller is, is participating, helping the buyer to make a decision. And hopefully if that seller do the, their job correctly, they'll come across as somebody who's adding value to that buying process. And they become a trusted advisor, right? So in that context, think of a seller as one that need to be really strong at building trust, be able to understand the problem the buyer tried to solve at a very deep level. And that understanding is a collaborative process with the sales engineer. The sales engineer can show product, but it's still up to the, the seller to map what feature solves what problem and try to articulate you know, the solution set. And not just in isolation, but in a larger context, how does this solution fit within your organization, et cetera. So there's a lot of stuff a seller, I think, still adds tons of value. If, if they're a good seller, if they're a bad seller, they lean back, they let the SC do their job. I don't think those sellers are going to be that effective. <laughs> no, I like that. Now, there's a use case you guys have on your website about how you participated in the Ventilator Training Alliance. I think this is just a, you know, just a great example of using technology to teach and scale education at a huge rate, uh, something that needed to be learned and distributed very quickly. Talk about that and how Allegro played a role in this Ventilator education. Yeah, we, we are super proud of that project. The whole thing started in April when people started to realize that there's tons of patients that need to be on ventilators and hospitals are getting donations from all over the place with different types of ventilator. Next thing you know, you got frontline healthcare providers who don't know what to do with these ventilators. So very quickly, we, we identified the gap. Now, if you think about training people on ventilators, the traditional approach you send them to a class or even e-learnings where they need to learn and sit through hours and hours of training materials. What we found that's most useful is a paradigm we call just-in-time learning, meaning, you know, you got a ventilator in front of you and you want to learn how to operate it. What's better than, in essence, watching a YouTube video about what to do with the ventilator, right? So that's the paradigm that we have. Think about YouTube type of learning versus in-class learning. And then all of us yeah. as consumer, we know how many things, I, I know how many things I've fixed in the house is by looking at YouTube videos, right? So it's the same paradigm. So the whole team got together working with one of our partner, Medtronic, and uh, together sign on all the ventilators out there that account for over 95% of the market share in the market and got their training material in these bite-sized video format onto a Lego. We roll out a platform and in a matter of 10 days, provide this application on Apple and Android to let front care healthcare providers be able to pull up any ventilator and be able to watch videos and look at training materials uh, while they're interacting uh, in, in their job. So it's, it's a really incredible uh, project that we took on with, with urgency, obviously. Did any of those uh, medical systems providers, did they have any numbers around how long it took so to train somebody on a ventilator, on how to use their ventilator versus, of course, what you guys were able to accomplish? Yeah. I'm I mean, I don't have the actual number, but I know that these are hours and upon hours of training that get reduced down to a, a bite-size at the point of need type of uh, uh, modality. I mean, think about what you learn in classrooms. Think of them as a just-in-case learning, if you will. I'm learning it just in case I need it, right? Yeah. Whereas we're doing just-in-time, meaning I know I need some information. I'm going to go find something that would, that would solve my problem. So there's a very very different efficiency difference between just-in-time learning with versus just-in-case learning, where I'm learning a superset of all the, all the knowledge I need to have in order to solve one problem in the future, maybe, you know? So that's the, that's a big difference. So a lot of your career has been spent this kind of like concept of like right messaging or proper information at the right time for the right person, uh, kind of the hit what you talked about, the just-in-time yeah. ability to learn. When I think about what you talked about with YouTube education, I'm the same way. Uh, for example, I changed out my, I'm trying to think of a home project. I did my garbage disposal last year. I just looked on YouTube. How do I change this out? Because I didn't want to pay whatever fees and I thought it was worthwhile to learn. Yeah. So we innately have this ability to, let's say, 
go find what we're looking for. Uh, we have this innate ability to like kind of, we, I, I don't know how you type in YouTube, but I literally type in like, how do I do X, Y, and Z? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm very clear. So on the reverse side, when you're programming or your programmers are building the Allego platform, what are you focused on that enables just-in-time learning to happen? Is it more the search, the algorithm that indexes the content? Is it about being able to decipher through, let's say, colloquial language and getting someone the right piece of information at the right time? Because obviously search is a big part of it. If it doesn't come back, if what I want doesn't come back, the platform isn't useful. I mean, that's, that's a fact. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's why we focus a lot on our methodologies and helping our organizations, helping our customers to, to understand there are certain sets of content they need to have in their system. It cannot be just about the platform. If, if, if we deploy a platform in a customers and they don't have useful information in the system for their sellers, that, that, that platform won't be useful, right? So part of our success in the market is that we're able to successfully partner with our customers. And we have this thing we call the blueprint methodology. We, we have seen so many, we have hundreds of customers. We've seen so many of these patterns that we know we can walk on in and say, here are the set of content you got to go try to get because we know your seller want these content. And we, we can help guide them to create them very easily, you know, in one tenth of the time it, it would take them traditionally to create these content and so forth. So we've got a whole set of methodology to make sure the right content is there as a baseline. Once you have that, our product can then provide the searches that you're talking about, as well as AI-driven AI recommendation based on the context, based on the deals they're working on, based on what works in the past, we can actually recommend the right type of content to the seller at that moment. So it's a combination of a push and a pull right, to make sure that, that uh, the seller is well prepared for what we call those are the moments of need. At the moment of need, they have everything at their fingertips. So give me an idea of what it takes to make sure that this is, that you can do this because I'm thinking about, you know, if I'm new to a Lego, right? Let's say I'm a new industry. Uh, I don't know what industry you're not represented in, but let's just say I'm one of those. Yeah. No, we sell to high tech. Yeah. But if I'm not, you know, kind of like what you did with Met, with uh, the ventilators, if you don't have previous examples of information like you don't have any previous models in in that realm how do you guys go approach it like how long does it take because like uh, oh, all right let's back up one second when i think about google let's use google photos the ability to recognize we use this example a lot in it visionaries the ability to recognize a dog well it first required tons of data of what a dog looks like flowed into the system so that it could begin indexing and understanding this is what a dog looks like right so that it can easily recall it when now time is necessary but if I'm new to a Lego and I don't, and you don't have another customer like mine, how does it begin to index and recognize what data is being fed to it so that it can return relevant searches right. when the customer needs it? Yeah. So what you're asking is at the heart of machine learning, right? Machine learning as a paradigm, as you know, and you may not know, but I did my graduate work in machine learning. That's actually where I got my degree. And in machine learning, it requires these examples. When you don't have enough examples, it gets trickier. Yeah. And the key sets of technology around there is heuristics, basically rules that you got to create, as well as a way to generalize more efficiently. There's algorithms that, that help you figure out how do I reduce the number of examples I need to get something done. And there are two ways to do it. One way is the system is pre-trained on a bunch of other related things so that the number of example you need to learn the new things is not as much. So for example, if you have a system that already recognizes dogs, you can create using the same system for it to recognize cats with a lot fewer example than it would be if you have a system that cannot recognize any animal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that's, that's sort of, I'm simplifying sort of the, the algorithm yeah. part of it. But in essence, for our customers, when they start with us, we give them a set of heuristic that works pretty well right out of the bag. And they are able to leverage those rules, if you will, to make pretty good judgment. But every time when their users are using our system, we're gathering more data. It makes the system smarter. And eventually, as a new employee, you come to a company, you're then leveraging your peers' behaviors and activities from you know, the last six months to help determine what content is most useful for you. So that's how the sort of the iteration goes, if you will. 
No, that's awesome. And for yourself personally, where do you spend most of your time and energy? Because you got a background in machine learning. You have obviously you are a successful businessman, CEO, oversee a lot of different elements of the business. Do you have any areas you choose to focus on at a Lego more than others? It's interesting. It it changes, right? So as you know, we talked about earlier with with my other companies, it's 18 years you go through a lot of change. I would say on average in a growing company, every three years, the CEO sort of takes on a different job almost. Right. So um, I would say today uh, we're growing very rapidly and there's a press release that's going to be out in a, in a few days that, that will show you how fast we're going. But I would say I'm focusing on making sure there's strong alignment in product and in customer success and sales. That's probably what I'm spending most time on. When I say alignment, I mean, I don't want to sell a Lego to companies that don't need a Lego. Mm -hmm. But for anybody who pick a Lego as a partner, we are going to have high confidence that they're going to be successful, number one. And number two, that they can grow with us as a customer, right? So for me, it's all about that alignment, that strategic alignment between what we sell, what types of customer we want to sell our solution to, and how do we ensure they're successful. That's really why I spend the most time on in getting all the teams aligned around that. Do you have any interesting examples you can share with us of something maybe you've uh, already developed where it was critical to align those three areas of the business in order to, let's say, get the outcome that you ultimately came out with? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we have customers that use our solution for an industry that we don't really address. You know, let's say you are in the, you know, uh, energy business for a particular type of mineral or something, you know, and, and there's some very deep need in that industry that at some point we're going to have to say, you know what, as a company, we may be big enough some, someday to go after your industry, but for today, I'm, you know, we, we're going to say no to you as a customer because it's too much lift for you and for us to make you successful. So for those accounts, I would rather not sell to somebody than to take their business and, and regret it or disappoint them, frankly. I believe that every customer that go with the Lego is going to be successful. And if you go survey the market, we have the strongest successful customer base and they they are raving fans of a Lego. And I think part of the reason because of that is we keep true to what I just said, which is when we take a customer, they will be successful. That's our commitment. Oh man, that, what you just said, uh, I remember reading this thing from Tony Shea at, at Zappos where he made a critical decision early on in the early stages of Zappos when he recognized that third-party sellers' ratings were poor. And so they just, he made the call like, I'm going to cut that line of business. And people said, why? It's a third of our revenue. Like he's like, because if I can't control the customer satisfaction here, this business is in trouble. And so he cut it yep. and people were shocked and said like, why would you not accept that revenue? Now, did you learn that lesson through experience or was it taught to you about taking on a customer that doesn't fit your technology? Definitely through experience. I, I will tell you, <laughs> I've made hundreds and hundreds of mistakes uh, all across the board from Unicat onward. I mean, I've learned to be okay with that. Yeah. You know, in fact, I've, I've, I was so okay with it now, I, I constantly tell my team, hey, I'm actually going to make 15%, 10% mistake every day, you know? <laughs> but, but, but it's your job to tell me which one, you know? So, so, so that we can check. But yeah, so it's, it's, look, the purpose of a company is to have a customer, you know, right? So it, it, having a successful customer underpins everything. So that, that's, that's one of our core operating principles in, in, uh, at Alego. So you sit in a very unique, you know, I want to go back to some of the earlier conversation we had. You sit in this unique domain in that you've built successful companies now, you know, not to make you feel you know, older, but <laughs> <laughs> through the 90s, the okay. 2000s, the sure. 2010s, now you're in 2020, right? <laughs> the 2020s. So your career spanned multiple decades. What is different or have you noticed anything different uh, about how whether it's how business is formed, how talent is now recruited, like what are some of the major differences that you've noticed in the tech industry between where you started in 92 with Unica to now at Alego? I would say that in general, things are easier. Back then we had to ship software on CDs. You know, we <laughs> have to, to build anything. We gotta, we gotta have a machine, a physical machine we're managing. I mean, things are just so much easier now than even 10 years ago. Uh, that's one. And two, I, I would say the pace of change and innovation are faster. Partly is because we can, right? We can innovate faster. We can, there's infrastructure in place that allow you to, you know, continue to modify and one up each other against competition. So in general, the pace is faster. I think the, the customers are smarter as well. The buyers have a whole lot more information. So this is where 
if you're a seller that you're not adding value to the buyer's journey, you're just not going to be that successful. So part of, if you think about all those, those areas, this is why I think Allego is such an important company because our job is to make, uh, you know, one thing we said to, to people is that, that Allego, we believe success at work is fundamental to human happiness. And our job here is to, to help our customer to, to have successful employees because successful employees would enable them to have successful customer and having successful customer is what builds successful company. Right. So it's pretty fundamental. Yeah. And the, you know, what, the way you just described it, it also introduces, and I think you mentioned like, it's, you know, it's easier to start, it's easier to scale and it's easier to ship product It's three of the things that you notice that are very different. Yes. That also means it's easier for a competitor to come up against you. And I feel like, you know, just five years ago, you rarely heard about sales enablement. Now I see tech companies all the time pitching, you know, we are a sales enablement platform. Yep. When the, the marketplace can, you know, in like any marketplace, the more success you have, the more others will come. How do you focus on keeping advantages over your, your peers or your competitors? Because a lot of times, and I think you'd agree in enterprise software sales or enterprise product pitches, the language starts sounding the same. You know what I mean? Like everyone says the same thing. They're going to say, you know, AIML sales enablement training. You know what I mean? Like they, they you could start saying the same buzzwords. Where do you think you're going to spend your energy in differentiating from the competition? Or are you one of the people that says, you know, don't worry about the competition and focus on the customer and that will guide the path. You just said one of our operating principles. We focus on the customer. We pay attention to competitions, but we are obsessed with our customer. That's the difference. And I think part of this is that it's very hard for a buyer to tell the difference between vendors just looking at their websites. Yeah. But the moment they talk to us, they will feel and, and immediately detect that we're just a different partner, a different company. And from that respect, I think what differentiates us apart is that we are, I think, a whole lot more committed in what we're doing to ensure every customer is successful, to build that strong relationship, and to count on them to be uh, referrals and, and references for us. That's kind of what we're about, you know, versus I'm here to sell you something and move on to the next guy. You know, that, that you can feel those kind of companies and they are, some of them may be successful, but a lot of them are going to fail because they're going to have a failed customer base. So that's how we see in the long run that we build our success. It's based on a culture of, a, of our company, based on what we believe in and uh, counting out a customer to, to keep us to be highly successful in the market. There you go. And how about on the product side, how does that culture fit? Let's say, how does that impact your tech teams? What do they feel? Like what's culturally different you think about working in a Lego? Because that's one of the things that there's a constant battle for now, right? The ability to recruit and retain highly technical skilled labor is a massive challenge. Every CIO, CTO, CEO, founder, whatever we talk to on this show, they always say like, this is a problem. Not the, it's not a bad problem. It's just a, it's just a reality of the business, which is so many people need highly technical, highly skilled people that really you're, you can't hope on pay alone because right, because someone can always outbid you. Right, exactly. What are some of the cultural things you're doing at Allego to keep people you know, working on the Allego product? So the thing that I, I think I'm most proud of in this iteration of, of my business as well with Allego is that, is that the, the culture of Allego is, is astounding. It's the most collaborative environment I've ever seen in any companies. And at the heart of it, I would say, it's really about intellectual honesty, the lack of ego, and being okay to, to say truth to power. It's a combination of those. So people who are, um, and this is not just the technical folks, but everybody in the company feels that as long as they are coming from a place of uh, good intent, they are free to say whatever they need to say, and there's no repercussion. You can, somebody can come up to me and say, you Chan, I think you're a fool of crap because of X, Y, Z. And I'm okay with that. You know? <laughs> and this goes on from top on down. There's no ego in the way we discuss. And it's a very refreshing environment. If you work in a place where there's no ego, not even the executive, that is all about opinions, truth, and judgment. And when you're in that kind of environment, you're just going to execute better because the right decision get made faster. There's no pretentiousness, no, no politics. You, know, you just kind of get things done faster. No, that, I love hearing that. So, and it sounds like, you know, if I'm putting the pieces together and you're guided by the customer, so you have an idea. So I'm guessing if you're, 
you're handling the product meeting. I'm an engineer. I'm working with you. And you say, oh, you have an idea. And I say, you Chun, I think that idea is okay, but let me hear what a, six customers said that they want. Oh, that happens all the time. Yeah. I'll be able to outvote you. It sounds like pretty easily. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, and it's, um, it gets some, some people, the newcomers to a Lego, it, it sometimes is jarring to see people stand up to power like that. But yeah. it's the healthiest thing that one can imagine in a company. And, um, you know, that's what we're about as, as an organization. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that you had your, you know, your focus of study was in machine learning and you've applied that principle as part of your journey, entire journey and career. What about the discipline of machine learning today? Because that's one of the conversations people love to have is like, because you've, you've seen it now evolved across since you were going to school. What is going to be unlocked in your opinion based upon AI ML? What do you, where do you foresee the future of tech? What are some unique perspectives you might have on what, do you, what we as customers are gonna experience in software in the next five to 10 years from AI and ML models that just keep getting better and better? Yeah, I mean, Albert, you're seeing the application of it all over the place, right? From self-driving cars to technology that help you determine how do you best organize your life to, you know, Alexa here. I can ask Alexa anything in, in the kitchen, you know, how many ounces is equal to how many teaspoons? I mean, it's, it's incredible, right? So, so you're seeing those kind of application uh, playing out. I actually think there's a huge opportunity in the B2B world where the consumer apps that we're so used to and some of the innovations there could be uh, applied in the B2B world. And that's my domain, right? Figuring out how do we apply AI and machine learning and leveraging data, which is, by the way, fewer data points than consumer. It's about two orders of magnitude less data for B2B, but yet there still is a lot of nuggets and insights that can be gleaned off of uh, B2B data and, and using that to help organizations navigate. So for example, I can see in the future in the Lego where you join a company and after a few weeks during your onboarding session, I can already tell what type of seller you are or what type of employee you are. And I kind of know, okay, you're probably this type of person and this is probably where you're gonna have the most trouble. You're gonna be good at the top of the funnel, but probably not good at negotiation. And we can pinpoint where the, the gap's gonna be and give you a personalized path on how to get you there from here very quickly. So almost like a personalized coach to each employee so that they can excel and improve faster than they would have otherwise, right? So that's one example. The other example is, you know, when a buyer is looking to buy something, there are a bunch of information that need to be exchanged. And sometimes we rely on the seller to ask the right set of questions, but I can totally see in, in the near future, we are able to help buyers navigate to a buying process by making sure that the critical information is, is surfaced and exchanged between the buyer and the seller so that the, the buying process is as smooth as possible. The right information is exchanged, even references, even competition, all that is surfaced very efficiently so that the value added in that engagement is not just what product this buyer make at the end, but it's, it's the experience, if you will, right? Enhancing that buyer experience. I can just go on and on. There's tons of application that I can see us building. Well, I'll, I'll you know, I agree. And I'm also going to say that first part you said, if you're able to tell the selling style and the funnel area of every seller based on your platform, I mean, your tool might become a recruiting tool too. I could see people putting, yep. <laughs> putting, putting uh, their new AEs as they're recruiting them to the test. Like, Hey, I've got more closers, but I need some funnel openers, you know, yeah. them being able to use the tool be like to uh, assess new, new talent. By the way, and part of this is, is organizationally too. So in my experience, only a small percentage, you call it maybe 10, 20% of sellers are good at the top of the funnel as well as at the closing, okay? It, it's maybe a mapping of personality or something, but, but there's, there's very few people that can do them all well, right? So part of this is to identify for each team where the gaps are and then augment each other. You know, in the old days, every seller's got to do everything. They're, I call them the lone wolves, right? They're yeah. sort of going to the field by themselves with a bag and they're on their own, right? I think the future of selling is team selling where you have teams of people helping each other to be successful, collaborating and sort of gain tackle the whole market together. And if you think about the competition, if I got a team of lone wolves versus a team of collaborative seller, 
the cloud itself is going to kick their ass, right? Because they're, they're, they're going to learn so much faster and compete so well compared to lone wolves that that is, to my, in my opinion, the future of, of, of selling going forward. I'm telling you right now, some private equity guys are probably squirming. They heard that, you know, they, they want to just be able to throw heads and numbers at the uh, problem and just knock it down through quota attainment. <laughs> right, exactly. Brute force may work, but, but uh, it, it only work until the next best algorithm come along and just, you know, knock you over. There you go. It looks like you guys are trying to be that algorithm that constantly figures out what is the best way to sell any customers given products and services. Yep. There you go. Well, you Chun, it's now time to go to the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to us by Salesforce Customer Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. And you Chun, this is where we ask you questions outside of work so that people can get to know you a little better. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. All right. Now everyone knows you are famously or infamously, I think famously, because I thought that was cool. Because I remember reading, bringing down the house the first time I it was introduced to the MIT card counting team. Do you still play blackjack? I taught all my kids blackjack this past summer because of the COVID pandemic. They got nothing to do. So they are all certified. So I'm just waiting for them to turn 18 so I can take them through the casino. Or 21, I guess, in this country. Will you be allowed to go into the casino? Only some of them, unfortunately. But I know which one. <laughs> I love it. What else do you do besides, you know, what else do you do for fun? Uh, you've obviously built businesses. You've played cards in the past. What do you do for fun? I love skiing. I, love, I You know, these days I prioritize my fun time with spending time with my kids. Uh, they only have a few more years left. So, uh, you know, before they go to college, I try to spend time with them, um, you know, watching movies, we ski together. This past season, we do, we do a lot of hiking as well. You know, basically a bunch of any activity I can spend time with them. All right. So you're, you're an outdoorsman. You like keep your family outside. Now I got to ask, because obviously I had immigrant Chinese parents. I got to know, do because you've set a quite a high standard, Ivy League, MIT, building businesses. Do you think you put pressure on your kids? I have to admit, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, my, my, my second daughter is going to MIT as a freshman. And uh, I think part of the reason she's there and she said, you know that, in our dinner conversation, instead of talking about how's your day, I will be drilling her like, what's 10 factorial? <laughs> Uh, how, do, how do a machine recognize handwriting? You know, she said, you know what? All those conversations actually helped me to where I am. So I'm proud of that. No, no, no. I, I think it's a great way to raise kids. It's okay. I think it's a lot. Little pressures never hurt anybody. I think that's, a, that's part of it. So you've set up a high standard. You've set a high expectation. So we got to ask, you also are a man of the arts. It looks like you're on the board of multiple art museums. Tell us what, what, what is your favorite style of art? Yeah, you know, I've, I've always, I would say my mom... Uh, make sure that I don't become an artist uh, because she's worried about if I would ever earn a living. If it weren't for her, I'd probably be an artist today, to be honest, because I, I have a passion for that. I mean, if anything, I think part of my problem is I love too many different types of art. Uh, so I, I love to look at them. I ask my wife all the time, so do you like this, do you like that? So I would say I go for the, the chase of art, if you will, and she, she has a taste, I always say. You know, she made the she made the judgment at the end of the day whether we buy something or not. Uh, but yeah, but in general, so so modern contemporary is really where where I anchor our our collections. How about yourself? Do you like to paint yourself or sketch yourself or sculpt yourself? I used to, but nowadays, hang up for maybe my retirement. I can always come back to it. There you go. I got to ask one final question before we go, and that is: Do your kids think you're cool? I think they do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I feel like you are, man. Every time I hear your story or a little piece of your story, I always go back to that book, Bring Down the House. And I was like, when I first read it, and I was like, oh my God, these kids were awesome. <laughs> that was a fun time for sure. Well, Yuchun, thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Thanks for sharing all the things you're doing at Allego and how AI ML is going to help and assist sales enablement in the future. Awesome. That was fun. Awesome. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com platform.